Good morning, good afternoon, and good night, depending on where you're coming from. I am Purple Sway 22, and this is my co-host, Style Pigeon. This is Gingerly. Today, we're doing the FUD episode, or what the FUD. We're going to be talking about <laughs> <laughs> problems that people come up with about Bitcoin. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. Good morning, Style Pigeon. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great. I'm excited to be here, too, actually. I'm interested to hear some answers on this, too, because this is going to help me pretty practically in my own life. Uh, just talk to parents, friends, family, uh, people around me. So I'm, I'm stoked to get some uh, good responses to have locked and loaded. Yeah, no, that's the goal of this episode. I, I hear all the time and I have these conversations all the time. People like, oh, you're into Bitcoin. You know, like, doesn't that do such and such? And don't, only criminals use it. So um, I really hope that coming out of this conversation, uh, both Style Pigeon and people watching will have lots of tools to be able to have intelligent conversations and maybe sway some people towards Bitcoin. So uh, with that, I want to give a quick pitch for our sponsor, uh, Roundly X. Uh, you can go to roundlyx.com and check them out. Um, we're sponsored by them. They're a simple to use app that allows you to purchase Bitcoin and other crypto assets with spare change automatically anytime you make a purchase. Um, the set it and forget it DCA or dollar cost averaging tool helps you build wealth safely and conveni conveniently over time. Um, and RallyX actually helped me pay off my uh, car in a time of financial distress. So highly recommend you check them out. Big thanks to RallyX for sponsoring us. And uh, with that, let's uh, let's dive in. Oh, that never gets old. I freaking love I'm gonna that be, intro video. I'm going to be triggered by it soon because I know like uh, when I hear my uh, specific alarm go off, if I hear it during the day, because I use it to wake up every morning, if I hear it during the day, it automatically like washes me with this like <laughs> sleepiness. I'm like, oh my God, I feel like it's 5 a.m. I want to go back to sleep. But this is going to be the exact opposite. I'll hear that tune and be like, let's do this. Yeah. Time to go. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, with that energy, um, I, I was talking about who was I? I was talking to my wife about this episode and um, she was like, you know, I don't know that everyone's going to know what FUD stands for. So it's F-U-D. And um, whenever you hear that term, it stands for fear, uncertainty and doubt. It's the type of like things that people might say, like um, uh, for like, oh, you drive a Ford. Like I've heard that they break down all the time. Like, are you sure you're going to stick with Ford? Like that's that's the type of questions that we're going to cover today about Bitcoin, the stuff that people say that's negative, that may not have a lot of context behind it, um, and, are, and are popular arguments against Bitcoin. Um, yeah, I kind of think of it as almost like propaganda. It's kind of how to fight against propaganda, because when you think about like political stuff, I, I don't want to get too esoteric, like right out of the gate. But when you <laughs> think about uh, you, propaganda, the thing that propaganda does really well is it provides misinformation and it creates fear, uncertainty and doubt. And those yeah. things are a really good way to tear things down and uh, keep them from gaining momentum. Uh, so we definitely want to fight against that as much as we can with Bitcoin. Uh, we actually had a conversation the other day that was like right up this alley um, where it was one of those things where I didn't realize that I was including John in a conversation that was definitely without a doubt headed down this path. And <laughs> he jumped in and uh, kind of handled things really well uh, just from a... Uh, helping out people's standpoint you know it was very kind and very uh helpful in the places that you needed to be uh, i was i was really happy to see how well you handled it so i'm happy to learn a little bit more today yeah thanks man and honestly like so a reason that these conversations are often so charged is because there's a lot of emotion behind it right and like we've said several times that emotion is the enemy if you have emotion in your um savings financial strategy you're probably going to make mistakes and uh, that's the same thing with conversations. I mean, as soon as these big emotions get in here, you start thinking like, oh, no, they're going to think poorly of me. Like, I, I'm not going to ask follow up questions to them because it's going to make me look dumb or, you know, any number of things. Like maybe you don't have the data or you don't feel prepared to have the conversation. And for me, you know, I've been having these conversations since like 2015. I've been doing this for a long time. Um, and the only way you make it is by having these conversations, going through some uncomfortable situations. And, um, you know, it's just part of the game. So, um, yeah. I hope okay. we, so since so. you've been having those conversations for so long, what's, what's the one big one that everybody always gets without a doubt, hands down. If you start one of these conversations where you're like, Oh, let me tell you about Bitcoin. What's the one that everybody immediately says. 
Yeah, in my experience, um, that's Bitcoin is only used by criminals. <laughs> um, it's it's a big one, um, and that's mainly because I think like when Bitcoin first made major news waves uh, back in the day, it was over the Silk Road. I, I don't know if you've heard of the Silk Road. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I've I've heard of it. For, yeah, and a lot of people have. Like I feel like even the normies that I talk to or no coiners, um, as, as you will, have heard of the Silk Road. So for those people who may, might not have heard about it. Um, it was a dark net website or just a website that was put up that's not, you know, legally sanctioned, uh, created by a guy named Ross Ulbricht. Um, and thanks, Nick. That's great. I, I would highly recommend reading a history of the Silk Road because it's important not just for Bitcoin, but for an idea of a decentralized marketplace. I personally don't think that the Silk Road was a bad thing. Um, the things that were done on the Silk Road, obviously, there was some illicit activity that happens. We don't need to have that conversation right now, but Bitcoin was the primary driver of the Silk Road because of its decentralized nature, right? People can use it across international borders. They can use it more privately than you can use like a bank card. And so Silk Road was kind of the platform that allowed Bitcoin to really flex its muscles and be used for real decentralized marketplace activities. And that included stuff like drugs, hitmen, um, you know, prostitutes like anything you can imagine anything and everything and there was like fake passports i mean all of the things um and the founder ross ulbrich got arrested um when he was young and got two life sentences um for making that website and um, that's what a lot of people know bitcoin for is is for that and so that that was back in like 2015 i believe um 2014 15 maybe 16 when it all went down uh, and so, yeah, that's what stood out in people's minds. So real quick, how, so I know I get all of the illegal traffic sort of stuff. It's like, yeah, of course the DEA is going to come after you. The FBI is going to sure. come after you. Like you're doing some illegal stuff or at least, uh, manifesting that illegal stuff or providing a platform for it. But where does Bitcoin come into this? Because Bitcoin's a hundred percent transparent. Ultimately, why? would a criminal want to use something that's totally transparent no that's a very great and insightful question um and so this gets at the contextual questions that i like to ask people right to follow up and be like well have you thought about this <laughs> so that's okay. a great segue okay cool um so yeah when i when people ask me this i'm like well given that bitcoin is fully transparent it doesn't make a lot of sense to try and do illicit activity right because the DEA can just go in and audit and pull those threads and eventually find out who's who and they did right that's why ross yeah. got arrested and that's why a lot of the people that were involved did get arrested. None of them got as much time as Ross did, which I think is a totally different issue. We can talk about that later. Um, well, hey, I'm but, a lawyer. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, but Bitcoin in and of itself was the vehicle because it's a it's a, it's trustless, right? It's built off of math um, and the way that it plugged into the Silk Road uh, used escrow, which is just locking up money. Um, in a way that both parties can agree to a particular transaction and then unlock it once that is agreed upon. Or if it's not agreed upon, you just quickly do some third party. Um, it's not arbitrage, but it's a uh, it's a process by which it's a mediation. Right. And then we agree. Yeah. And then the funds are either permanently locked up. No one gets anything or they're distributed back. Um, so it was a really cool incentive mechanism. Right. Because people could think, oh, I, I can just lock up my Bitcoin. It goes into escrow on the Silk Road. And um, it gets settled, even though it's like transparent with, I think we talked last week or the week after about, yeah, Tornado Cash, about mixing Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. It makes it yeah, yeah. makes it more private, right? Not completely private when you put it through all of these different transactions. So say like I wanted to buy some drugs from you because that would never happen. But if, for instance, we wanted to do that, I would like to say, okay, I want this. I'm going to put my Bitcoin into this. The Silk Road holds it for us. You see that that Bitcoin was deposited. I see that it was deposited. You agree to the sale. I agree to the sale. Once a trigger is hit, which is usually the order being shipped with a confirmation, then the funds get taken out of escrow. And so as you can imagine, the Silk Road was a very valuable platform because it pretty much enabled anyone anywhere in the world to be able to provide and like buy a good or a service uh, without any type of company facilitating that. Right. It's actually almost uh, Amazon almost mimics 
what the Silk Road originally was just for all products. And then of course, minus the illegal products um, yeah. or services. So I, I wonder um, if something like Bitcoin could be just simply laid over Amazon in a way where we we can do that internationally much easier. I wonder how much overhead and cost goes into Amazon processing fees and things that would immediately get eliminated and drop cost to the mm -hmm. end users, as well as probably the sellers, uh, ultimately, yeah. if they were to just switch over. I mean, not that I'm trying to get Amazon to switch to Bitcoin tomorrow or anything, but sure. I mean, it would be a handy tool. So uh, all of that stuff aside, because we kind of are going down the escrow rabbit hole, just of how the yeah. website functioned and everything. Right. Um, we answered the question as far as why Bitcoin was practical on the Silk Road. It's mainly just because of the uh, international borders, because they were doing stuff all over the planet. Uh, right. Bitcoin was a great way for them to just have a unified exchange of value, uh, and they could use that to trade for goods and services. So, but we still haven't answered the question of why people still think that Bitcoin is a thing that, you know, let's say I was a hitman or whatever, right? Sure. And I'm going to use Bitcoin, but the government can track all of that stuff. Why? What's what's the advantage? Um, so, I mean, the advantage is the government has to track it, right? So they actually have to put the mm -hmm. manpower and the effort into making that happen. And so far, the United States government has been very gray or like, um, I don't know if laissez-faire is the correct word there for that, but they've, they've just been very hands-off or like they, they haven't really made any large moves to regulate or actually put effort into tracking Bitcoin. Um, when things like the Silk Road come up, honestly, it was actually a hitman scenario that caused the Silk Road to blow up so publicly. I think if they had just stuck to like drugs or, or fake passports or whatever, they might have lasted a lot longer. Not that that's good, you know, but um, the fact that it got to where it did so quickly kind of escalated it to a point where the U.S. government was like, OK, we have to deal with this swiftly and we got to make an example out of somebody. Um, and that's what happened to Ross. Right. And so it was such an extreme example that Bitcoin became tainted. Right. For for several years. Um, but so I kind of want to move on to like the is Bitcoin only used by criminals. Right. So it's been around since like 2011. It's been around for a long time. And back in the early days, my assumption was, you know, probably like 20 or 30 percent, maybe even 40 percent of Bitcoin is being used for illicit activity because you can do stuff like the Silk Road um, and you can, you know, like cash, use it to like more anonymously transact than you can with, say, credit or debit. Yeah. At the time, it was kind of like the black hat versus white hack or sorry, black hat. <laughs> I'm going to get it. I you got promise. It. You got it. The black <laughs> hat versus white hat uh, dichotomy, right? Where right. where Bitcoin came around. And so the black market people were like, ooh, nobody else knows about this yet. We can yeah. use this to exchange funds. And then eventually the white hats catch on and they're like, oh, we need to figure out how to track this and, and, and prosecute this ultimately. And so the black hats go, oh, OK, Bitcoin's done now. You know, Fred got arrested. Uh, he got found out. So we're going to be better than Fred and we're going to come up with this other new solution. Um, yeah. Thank you, Nick. Uh, I guess some, Nick some, some people yeah. might not know what black hat versus white hat uh, is. Uh, a lot of times uh, people like actually we were talking about Sammy Kamkar uh, mm -hmm. last week. He would be considered a white hat hacker. Uh, he hacks things like uh, even key fobs and whatnot uh, for cars just to show uh, the companies that are developing those things like, hey, he, I found a workaround on one of your products. You need to fix this for security reasons. Um, so the money. White Hats did a, yeah, there's great money in that. And I think he was even hired to bring down some uh, people over in Romania that were doing some like large scale credit card fraud and whatnot, like really large scale uh, hacking right. actual banks and things. But uh, we need, we kind of need both really for innovation, like the black, hats are the ones who always adopt like uh youtube or whatever first you know this new technology that comes out black hat always is on the uh forefront uh that gets back to you know if you really want to predict the market uh the two people that you should look at are drug dealers and and porn creators right like yeah, they're the right. ones that are always on the forefront of tech which yeah. is weird yeah no you're you're 100 right and oftentimes those black hat hackers who get caught will be turned into white hat hackers because yep. of their knowledge right and so um sometimes that comes out in plea deals um, so what if we pay you <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> hold on. <laughs> um, but so no, so this is a this is a nice transition because these types of rumors, you can see how this is fun to talk about, right? Black hat hackers, white hat hackers, like Bitcoin is bad. It's the dark it's super web. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Everyone's like, oh, we got to talk about this. And 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 the prevailing sentiment was that's all that Bitcoin is. It's a black hat device to like skirt the law. And when you start looking into it, like there were some people a couple or a couple months back, beginning of this year, a couple who made off with one of the largest like heists in the history of Bitcoin. It was something like a billion dollars or something crazy Jesus. like that that they stole. But they did no work at all to hide it. And so it came back to I was like, guys, you're using a transparent public ledger that anybody can audit. And they were caught in like three days. It was crazy how fast they were. Going. <laughs> but all of this ties back to like it's people wanted to know, is it actually used by criminals? Because we have the blockchain, right? We can, in theory, audit the entire freaking thing and see what percentage of it is actually used for illicit activity. So and, how much um, of it is used for illicit activity today? No, that's, that's really question. the answer that we need, right? Yes, that is a great question. And thankfully, our friends at Coin Center actually dug in and they did all of this work to find out. Um, so Nick, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and pull in that next resource. Um, as it turns out, data suggests that less than 1% of all Bitcoin transactions are illicit. And when I first read this, I was like, what? This is crazy. <laughs> There's like no way this can be true. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I just want to pull a couple of like nice little stats here, but I highly recommend if you're watching this, go ahead and pull up this uh, study, give it a read through. Coin Center guys do great work. As it turns out, only 0.61% of the money entering conversion services during the four years which were an analyzed were verifiably from illicit sources with the highest proportion of the study was 1.07% and that was in 2013. So kind of like I said, oh. my perception was in the early days, there was a massive amount of illicit activity. But this study actually says, no, actually only 1%, barely above 1% was the highest concentration of illicit activity ever seen in the Bitcoin network. And that was in 2013. Um, and by all accounts, it's been going down since then, right? Corporations have been getting in, governments have been getting in. And so that's pressing down the amount of illicit activity by adding in more licit activity as it were <laughs> yeah and i also so argumentation is something that i really enjoy something that i i like in theory to discuss and and go after one of one my big argument here if somebody were to come to me or i'm telling them about yeah i love bitcoin uh it's it's going to be a really revolutionary technology it's going to change the way that we think about and go about uh the exchange of value not to mention many other things that are coming down the pipeline um, the big argument here for me is if somebody says, well, Bitcoin's used for uh, a bunch of illicit activity and say, oh, okay, you know what else is used for a bunch of illicit activity? U.S. dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Cash, I wonder cash. what percentage of U.S. dollars are actually used for illicit activity. Yeah, no. And that's a great question because when I read that study, that was the exact first thought that I had. I was like, oh my God, like, okay, I'm not, I'm not the best person, right? I've used cash to buy stuff that maybe I shouldn't have. And, and it, a lot of people do that kind of thing too. Like if you want to not be traced, what's your first thought? I'm gonna go get some cash. Um, right. Story time, when I was in college, I was raised by an ultra conservative family. And um, I like, I wasn't allowed to smoke tobacco or anything. And so when I turned 21, I was like, I want tobacco. So I, every time I went to Walmart, I would like take out a small amount of cash after my purchase, right? So you can get cash after you buy something. So I'd buy like some some soda or something. And then I would pull out five dollars, and I would, uh, yeah, hey, th thank you for this, Nick. This is great. Five hundred dollar Walmart gift card. Help the feds catch these involved in a. It was four point five billion dollar Bitcoin. Jesus. Yeah, that's crazy. Don't use Bitcoin to <clears throat> money launder. Use cash. <laughs> cash is much better. <laughs> not that um, we're giving advice on money laundering, no, but no, no, Bitcoin's not all, definitely not, not the way to do yeah, it. <laughs> definitely not the way to do it. Um, but so anyway, moral of my story is if I wanted to buy my tobacco, I would save up my cash after going to Walmart for like a month. And then I would have a stack of cash. I could go to the tobacco store, buy whatever I wanted. And my mom, who was monitoring my debit account, like wouldn't know because <laughs> I had stacked up that cash. Had I been using Bitcoin, it would be super easy to just go back and be like, yo, why did you get this extra amount of Bitcoin? Like, it, here it is. It's in super plain yeah. English, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, think about it. Do you honestly think that out of the, you know, trillions of dollars worth of cash that are in circulation in the United States, that less than 1% is used for illicit activity? 
And now think about the fact that the dollar is used worldwide as a monetary standard. There's no way. I mean, I, I think that my original calculations for Bitcoin being 20, 30 percent illicit. I mean, that's got to be the U.S. dollar, right? There's traces of cocaine on, on dollars, like a large percent of dollars. Um, there you so, go. yeah, there you go. Nick a great the ball study. again. Yeah, Nick is killing it. Thanks, man. The dollar far outstrips cryptocurrency and illicit activity usage. Great article. Give that one a read over. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and honestly, like Center does great work. There's lots of studies that support this. This is a pretty old argument, honestly. Um, and I've seen it start to fade out of circulation. Like when I start to talk to people, um, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, a, a guitarist here in Austin not too long ago. Super cool guy, really talented, a hippie. Um, we were hanging out together and he found out that I work in Bitcoin. Um, and he was his first argument actually caught me off guard. Almost everybody says isn't only used for criminals. His first question, which is the next FUD question that I'd like us to talk about was, well, isn't Bitcoin terrible for the environment? Like I read, you know, MSN said not too long ago that it's going to boil the oceans by like 2024 <laughs> kind of thing because of the amount of energy that it uses. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, you laugh, but I mean, people seriously think that kind of thing. Like, <laughs> well, people seriously think a lot of stuff. That's true. No, that is. True. Um, so but, what's but, the argument for Bitcoin boiling the oceans? Um, essentially, it's, it's in the amount of energy usage uh, that Bitcoin uses. So a lot of different firms, especially mainstream media firms who didn't fully understand what Bitcoin is and the value that it has, kind of came out and did some very loose, like back of the napkin types of uh, energy equations and said Bitcoin is using like as much energy as countries. And, you know, that's a, a, the current adoption level. Right. So like if we scale and Bitcoin is used globally, it's going to destroy the planet. And that's some basic extrapolation slash generalization that isn't actually true. But like we said at the beginning of the show, um, emotion really gets people going. Right. And so if you say Bitcoin's bad for the environment, well, that's a hot button issue. Right. Like people yeah. want to be against things that are bad for the environment. It's one of the easiest things to be against. You know, I, I really don't blame them either. Like, I, I yeah. understand that it's destabilizing. And and that's really where I think a lot of the actual objection comes from. It's not that uh, Bitcoin is used for illicit activity or that Bitcoin is used or uh, potentially uses consumes energy. Those things are not true. So, well, why would anyone bring up these non-true arguments? Well, it's because they're afraid. And and that's that's what what. FUD is, right? Is yeah. they're just afraid. They have fear and uncertainty around this new thing that's potentially destabilizing to the current system or paradigm that they think in. Uh, they don't necessarily exist within the paradigm that they think in. Uh, it's kind of something else, but which gets a little heady. I apologize. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I get to 30,000 foot level really, really fast. Um, so our friends. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, that and the fact that we're family helps as well. That's a little yeah. bit of convenience there. <laughs> In case you um, haven't noticed, we are related. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so with the energy thing, what what's their argument? Why do they think that it's going to... What was the original tidbit of information that they had? Uh, and why is that inaccurate? Yeah, no, th those are great questions. So you're asking follow-up contextual questions. And I think that is... The first observation we need to make here most of these people they see that i'm an uh, amazing conversationalist yes, you're amazing okay. yes you're the <laughs> best <laughs> no, sorry i didn't mean to interrupt no no it's all good follow-up converse like contextual questions are extremely important because they don't get asked in this particular question they saw a clickbait headline that said like bitcoin uses as much energy as the netherlands or like you know as whatever country and if you scale that up we're doomed People love the doom and gloom kind of stuff, but I, I want to just throw out some follow-up contextual questions real fast that may help people watching and you yourself like kind of see where I'm going with this. So if, say, Bitcoin uses too much energy, my follow-up questions for people are automatically these. Okay, so how much energy does Bitcoin actually use, right? That do you know? Most people don't, right? How, why does Bitcoin use so much energy? I mean, that's worth asking, right? Like, can we justify uh, the amount of energy of that we're using? Is there value afterwards? Um, another good question. Does energy usage increase with the number of Bitcoin transactions? That's an assumption that people make in that original article, right? They're like, okay, here's how much 
energy it's using. If we get full adoption, then we're going to have this much energy usage. Well, that may not be the case. You know, there may be some mechanisms in Bitcoin that make that different. And I definitely want to cover this um, because, as you might think, uh, that is not the case. <laughs> and then and then maybe the most important contextual question for me, in my opinion, can we compare Bitcoin's energy usage to traditional payment technology like credit cards? And the answer is kind of. <laughs> and so I want to kind of just. If you're down, we can go through each one of these questions and like talk about them. And hopefully all of us will have a little bit more context for like how much energy Bitcoin uses and why it's not bad. Dude, I'm um, down like USD. Let's do it. Awesome. Dude, that was a great line. <laughs> we might have to clip that out. Um, <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. Okay. So as last time, I'm relying on a Coin Center article or a study here. Um, I've got it linked. We'll include it in the resources afterwards. Um, so I'm just going to go through really quickly and we're going to blast out each one of these questions. Thanks, Nick. Sweet. There's the article. Highly recommend. This is like even better than the is Bitcoin only used by criminals because this really goes through. It dives through each one of those questions I just asked and it very easily explains Bitcoin's position with energy. Um, so first of all, the easy answer for how much does how much energy does Bitcoin use? That's 110 terawatts per year. And it's like, OK, well. I'm not an electrical engineer. That means absolutely nothing to me. Um, but I did kind of drop it earlier on. That's about as much energy as the Netherlands uses. Shout out to our boy Nick, who is in the Netherlands. Um, but that's it's about so the Netherlands uses about 111 terawatts a year. So we're right at the same level. Um, Nick, no need to keep that article up. Yeah. Oh, thanks okay. For that. We'll 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 put we'll that back, back back up here in a little while. Um, so yeah. So. Um, I was following along. I apologize. Yeah, no, 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 no worries. Um, so the quote, I'm going to pull this quote from the article real fast. It says, as of June 2021, so pretty recently, estimates suggest that Bitcoin uses something around 110 terawatt hours per year, which for scale is close to the electricity consumption of the Netherlands. But, and this is important, it's a bit less than the global phantom electricity consumption from electronics that are left plugged in while in standby mode. And that blew me away, right? Because people always tell me like, hey, if you want to save money on energy, like unplug your Xbox, you know, like unplug your microwave, unplug your Keurig, because there is this phantom drain by a lot of things being held in standby mode, right? So um, your Xbox, like the reason it can come on so quickly is because it's actually just resting. When you hit that button, it turns on fast because it's already using energy. So right off the bat, we're seeing that Bitcoin actually uses less energy than idle appliances that are left plugged in, right? I mean, that's that's pretty mind blowing just from one contextual question follow up. Now that's that's worldwide for yeah. Bitcoin and for the uh, ambient electricity draw. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Per year. Per so, year. Got it. Yeah. Yep. I just want to be accurate because it's really important. You know, we we talk about them being inaccurate all the time. It would be unfair for us to do the same thing. Sure. No, absolutely. hundred um, percent. And while we're on this topic, like I, I just want to throw out a list of things that you can think about that might use more energy than Bitcoin. What about private jets that all of our politicians use all the time? You know, what about every single ATM that's across just the United States? Right. And, and we can talk about that a little bit later. I've got some crazy stats on that. Um, what about you know, like any of the entertainment mechanisms, like I talked about, like your Xbox that you leave plugged in. Um, or Tesla's for crying out loud, really Tesla's. Like we're, we're promoting the heck out of EV. And then at the same time being like, well, we don't want to consume too much electricity. Right? No, I mean, okay, well, we need a bigger solution than that. Bitcoin's not the issue here. The issue is the infrastructure that's involved in producing the electricity that we consume. Yes. Another great article, Nick, appreciate you, man. So Bitcoin mining draws 15 X less power than global aluminum smelting so it's like okay you know aluminum cans we know are a huge pollutant right like and there's tons of them um and that alone consumes 15x more energy than bitcoin so i think we're starting to to you know beat a dead horse a little bit here a little bit of basic research shows you okay there's a lot of stuff that uses way more energy than bitcoin does so and we intend to put all of those links down in the description yep. so to speak yep, okay yep, yep. good Good. Yep. All those I'll need to actually be, do more research in the future. For sure. Follow up tweet. So whenever you're watching this broadcast, just underneath the broadcast link, there should be a nice list of resources. Um, cool. So yeah, I want to um, 
kind of move on from from comparing energy usage. Uh, and the next thing I wanted to look at was the idea of Bitcoin actually progressing towards uh, carbon neutrality. Um, and let's see. Wasn't there uh, a really cool thing where uh, somebody used some alternative energy sources or something uh, to run yeah, a mining yeah, yeah. op? Yeah, totally. So I, last thing I want to say, I was looking through my notes here. Last thing I wanted to say, the 15X of uh, aluminum smelting reminded me. My last, uh, well, I'm skipping questions. I'm getting too excited. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> so, so we've hit how much energy does Bitcoin use? Um, the next question that we hit was why does Bitcoin use so much energy? Um, oh, I'm not yeah, going to spend yeah. a lot of time on this, but, but this is important, right? So um, a lot of people think mining Bitcoin is the super selfish process where people, rich people can go buy a bunch of mining rigs and enrich themselves by turning electricity into Bitcoin, right? The term mining itself is not actually the best term. If you read the Bitcoin white paper, that term doesn't show up in the white paper at all. Mining is something that has become to exist because of the way we talk about a complex subject, which is actually minting, right? So miners, okay. in effect, are minting or creating new Bitcoin. Without them, we wouldn't be able to produce Bitcoin continually, right? And that's the value. We know that Bitcoin has 21 million, but to get to 21 million, we have to people that we have to have people dedicate their electricity to creating those Bitcoins. So the why is like, well, if you want Bitcoin, we have to dedicate some energy to it. And if you think about the fact, like we've talked about in the last couple episodes, decentralization, personal sovereignty, an alternative to the inflation that we're seeing globally, maybe there's a little bit of value in having Bitcoin consume that energy, right? Maybe more than aluminum smelting, maybe more than having sta idle standby appliances, right? Probably more than billions of hair dryers too. You'd think so. Yeah, you'd think so. So I'm just going to kind of leave that. I think we could go deeper on that. We might go deeper in the metaverse uh, later on, maybe not today, but we've talked about doing a golf session where we continue talking about some of these more complex topics. So, um, yeah, and one of the things that I also want to do is, you know, we're we're kind of glossing a lot of this in these first couple of episodes. I really want to have somebody who maybe actually runs a mining operation come in and talk in detail about what it is, what they actually do, what their overhead actually looks like, you know, obviously avoiding any actual details. But I'd like to have some experts that I could ask some questions of yeah. uh, at some point. Uh, that are involved in a different way uh, than than you and I are, because we're kind of like promo people, right? Like, yeah, we're sure. we're all about building the community and driving adoption and all this. So we're not the operations branch of the Bitcoin network, right? right? Well, I want to hear from some other people too. So let us know uh, via Twitter if you guys would be uh, interested in hearing a few more guests and maybe even some of the guests that you might like to hear uh, actually come yeah. on the show. We'd love to find out. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, I, you know, Compass Mining is a great company that does some good stuff. I'd love to have their their guys on here. Um, and like Pigeon said, if you guys have any ideas, please do tag them in the tweet broadcast below and let's make that happen. Um, so yeah, that's great. So moving on from like the why, um, a really important question. And, you know, I said that the most important is can we compare Bitcoin's energy usage to other things? But the does energy usage increase with the number of transactions question is really important. Because the super basic ample answer is, no, it doesn't. What's really cool about Bitcoin is that it was made to scale in a way where when transaction usage increases, energy us usage does not necessarily increase. Energy usage increases and decreases based off of the mining competition. Um, that can be correlated to Bitcoin's like hash rate or the difficulty that it takes to actually mint those Bitcoins. So I would recommend, I don't want to go through, we're already kind of, we're having a great time having this conversation. <laughs> Read that article from Coin Center that I just, uh, we just talked about because that question is kind of heady, um, but it's worth reading because again, the answer, does Bitcoin use more energy when we scale is no. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for this, Nick. Uh, there, when you're, when you're minting Bitcoin, you know, you could, uh, so this quote right here, I really like your three-year-old laptop can verify a Bitcoin signature in a matter of milliseconds, and you'd be hard-pressed to find even a scrap of evidence of that work in your electricity bill. Um, so, so yeah, dive in. That's a great section. Um, it's a very common misconception. I love to leave some you know, research for our viewers to do on their own. Um, so check that out. Uh, educate yourself a little bit. 
Um, and I want to just go ahead and move on, move on because that last question was, can we compare Bitcoin's energy usage to other, you know, uh, similar institutions like credit cards? Um, the answer again, is a super simple, yeah, it's kind of like comparing apples to oranges. Um, but at the end of the day, basic estimates say that the credit system with ATMs, banks, credit cards, debit cards, all that kind of stuff uses about five X the amount of energy that Bitcoin currently does. Um, and that's to say that also the uh, amount of energy that Bitcoin uses is not going to go up in a significant way, in a significant way, even at scale. Right. Yep. That's correct. Uh, and, and they're already using five X. That's correct. Yes, exactly right. Um, so, so there's some striking numbers in this quote that Nick's just highlighted for us. In the U.S. alone, there are over 4,000 banks, 75,000 branches of those banks, and over 470,000 ATMs. Each one of those has a carbon footprint, as does the computer accounts that links all of them. And then you got to think, too, this is something else you can do some more reading on. Bitcoin settles immediately. As soon as those transactions confirm, that money is gone and it's sent and it's there. But with the current legacy system, you may think when you swipe your credit card, that, that money is settled instantly. No way. It takes almost 30 days sometimes and four to five different payment settlements between the credit card company, between the grocery store you're shopping at, between the bank that you use, between the central bank that they get their money from. And it just keeps going and going and going. And so that exponentially multiplies the energy footprint of the legacy banking system which is huge, you know? Yeah. So I think so far, like we've asked some really good contextual questions. We've given some good data. Um, so if you're wondering, hey, does Bitcoin use more energy than X, Y, or Z? You should be prepared now to do a little bit of research and, and maybe think about it in a different way. Um, and so that being said, like you alluded to earlier, I really want to look at the next step, which is Bitcoin using alternate energy methods to actually bring us towards carbon negativity. So like the opposite of carbon footprint, right? Um, so Nick, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and throw out that next resource that I've got up here. Uh, what's really cool is that when this started kind of breaking, like people saying environmental issues are going to be the downfall of Bitcoin, um, there's this super famous tweet by Elon Musk, uh, no pressure to find this, Nick, uh, but it, he essentially said, like, I'm going to pause Bitcoin payments to Tesla until they can prove to me that Bitcoin can be 50% sustainable. And since that day, Big companies like ExxonMobil that we're looking at here went way out of their way to be like, OK, like we're going to do this. This is a great idea. Um, what like we're going to use the excess natural gas waste that we usually have to pay carbon credits for to offset. We're going to use that stuff to mine Bitcoin. And so now not only wow. are we not producing that carbon, we're using that waste to produce value. Right. So. If we think about scaling that, we can actually get into a scenario where big companies that had to pay carbon credits are now like taking carbon off the table and producing wealth at a scale we've never seen before. That's pretty dang yeah. exciting. And using like waste to do it. Like it's already yeah. there. We're just exactly. reallocating that instead of making it waste, we're turning it into a resource. Yep. And this, so ExxonMobil started working on this back in March. Um, and, and a lot of companies have actually moved this direction too. In fact, I don't have this resource handy, but um, data suggests that the Bitcoin ecosystem is actually over 50% sustainable now with all of the different companies seeing ExxonMobil's example. I mean, why wouldn't you want to turn your waste into literal digital gold? You know, I mean, yeah. it's a no brainer. Like when, when CEOs start seeing this, like, oh my God, we need to get on this ASAP. Not only do we turn waste into wealth, we no longer have to pay off these crazy carbon credit offsets. That's literally just a pay to play system. Like, what do you think yeah. paying for carbon offsets actually does? Right. Like you're just paying the government to allow you to emit. It's crazy. Yeah, it makes, it's it, that's called multiple income streams. Very smart yeah. by the government. <laughs> savage. So savage, but so true. Yeah. So, man, Nick is on it. Bitcoin mining efficiency up 63 percent in the year. Sustainable electricity mix jumped by 59%. I mean, thanks, Elon. A lot of people say that Elon, like, he, he manipulates, right? He causes trouble. But that one tweet might have, like, we could really be talking about Bitcoin radically changing climate change for the better. Um, yeah. And this is, like, the complete opposite 180 of where we started this episode, right? We were under the assumption that it's only used by criminals, that, like, it's bad for the environment. And now here we are saying that, like, well, actually... 
you know, Bitcoin could radically improve the environment. I'd actually be interested. I don't know how you'd be able to do this study, but and this is something that uh, Paul at Crypto Curator would be uh, probably interested in uh, enumerating as well. Is um, if you if you were to so I, I heard somebody talking about Bitcoin essentially being kind of a messaging system, mm -hmm. uh, just the way that the ledger operates. Uh, it's yeah. kind of less of an exchange of like a digital thing more of an exchange of a series of letters and numbers right um yeah. which is kind of getting a little bit technical but uh i was thinking what if we used bitcoin to actually exchange information uh as opposed to using something like email yeah i wonder how much energy emails use oh god compared to how much energy bitcoin would use in the same using the or having the same functionality yeah. No, that's a great question. And Paul would absolutely love to dive into that because yeah, he absolutely <laughs> hates email. <laughs> no, but that's a great question. Um, and, you know, for those of you curious who have made it to the end of the episode like this watching and you want to do more research, that's another great thing that you can do. Nick, Nick on point again. Check out this article from Hacker Noon. You can add messages to the Bitcoin blockchain and this guide breaks it down for you. In fact, I've done it before, right? So there's experimenting with... Um, even instant messaging over the Lightning Network, which I don't think we've ever talked about on Gingerly yet. Um, we're going to have to eventually because yeah, the, big, the Lightning Network on Bitcoin allows instant near free transactions globally. And it also allows what you're talking about, a transfer of like messaging information. Um, and miners can already do this as a cool little fact. Uh, whichever miner like actually like mints the current block. So every 10 minutes, there's a new block. They have the option to encode a message into the blockchain oh, cool yeah and if you go back through there are several like very famous um messages that have been encoded based on certain dates like i think on the 10 year anniversary of bitcoin coming out like the miner put some really big message to satoshi kind of thing um anyway really cool stuff uh, it's definitely the future um but kind of, so at the beginning of the episode i alluded towards you know making this a multi-episode you know what the fud kind of thing this is definitely part one but i wanted to throw out a couple of questions just for you and our audience to be thinking about. Um, I'm really thankful to uh, Phoebe Swanee, to Grandma Escher, uh, to Nick, uh, Jay Del Mulder, very, uh, various other people who hit me up with questions that they would like to see in future episodes. So here we go. I just want to throw these out here. Um, FUD questions for us to consider in the future. Bitcoin private keys are too hard. You can lose your money forever. That's a good one because there's that yeah. guy that went famous for losing like I don't know, it's like $200 million worth of Bitcoin in a landfill because he threw out his hard drive, right? Can you imagine? <laughs> so, I'm so that's trying a not to. Yeah, same. Um, next one is, what about the government seizing wallets when they find out that it's yours, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great question. Like, if that should be addressed, people wonder that. What if the government just takes it from you, right? Um, another, another question is, isn't Bitcoin just like another stock? Right. Or another investment vehicle that you use. Like, why is this an important thing? Um, and then another one is like, aren't there toxic people out there who like Bitcoin? Right. Why would I want to associate myself with those types of people uh, when it gives me a bad rap? All good questions. Right. And there's plenty more that we can talk about, like proof of work versus proof of stake. I have a buddy that I work with at Rally X who is really diehard into proof of stake. We've been having lots of conversations why maybe proof of work is a little bit better. Shout out to you, Sean. Hope you're having a good day. And we'll talk about that on a future episode. Um, but yeah, I feel like this is a really productive episode. How are you feeling, Pigeon? I, I mean, I feel great. I'm, I feel a little bit more equipped. Um, as always, I feel like I have a, you know, a library of Congress worth of research to do uh, post episode. Uh, but that's a big part of the fun for me, to be honest, is, is constantly learning and munching on information uh, and figuring out it's almost like a big puzzle, right? It makes me think yeah. of uh, Ready Player One, where mm. the main characters, you know, going down this sort of treasure hunt, or uh, what would you call that? Uh, uh, like scavenger hunt. Or yeah, scavenger hunt. Yeah, yeah and uh, trying to figure out, I'm trying to answer the question, why is Bitcoin the future? And I, I keep getting answer after answer after answer that are that add to my argument, which as a, person who likes to argue for fun is a gold mine, uh, yeah. a digital gold mine, if you will. <laughs> yeah. Hey, <laughs> I always like to say Bitcoin is unique in that whenever you learn more about it, you realize how little you actually know about it and how much more research you need to do. 
And so if that's you right now, if you're thinking, oh my God, this is so much information, I have so much research to do, but this is very compelling, you're in the right place. Like that's what we want Gingerly to be about. We wanna provide Absolutely. you with new things to think about, new ways to talk about Bitcoin and more research to do. Um, and we'd love to hear from you guys. If you're watching and you have a new episode idea or a question that you have about crypto or Web3 or NFTs or anything, and you wanna be like, guys, I wanna be able to talk about this more intelligently, Hit us up in the comments. Leave us a comment and say, you know, let us know what you want to talk about. We could feature you in the next episode. Um, and like Pigeon mentioned, we're going to be having guests on soon. I mentioned our good friend Fibo Swani. We want to have him on to talk about Fibonacci charting of like Bitcoin movements. We want to have on mining people to talk about how that actually works. Um, so, yeah, all that and more coming. Um, Gingerly is only getting better. And I'm really happy to be on this rodeo with you, dude. It's a good time. Yeah, I'm having a blast. I'm having a blast. I can't wait till two weeks from now. <laughs> it's going to be a good time. Cool. Well, I think that about does it. So um, in the meantime, please follow Purposeway22. Please follow Style Pigeon uh, on Twitter. Uh, we do lots of cool stuff other than gingerly. We stream weekly VR stuff uh, on Style Pigeon's channel. Style Pigeon streams Rocket League stuff. He does NFTs. Um, I'm working with Roundly X, as I said. Um, so there's always something to do in the gingerly ecosystem. It's always a pleasure, man. Thanks for being on, Mr. Style Pigeon. Big That's shout out to Nick. As always, man. If you guys are looking for more shows to watch, we're a part of the Bitcoin Live Network. There's at least four other shows that are fantastic. We mentioned Crypto Curator. He's got two shows. Uh, so check him out. And we will be back in two weeks' time for episode four. Uh, with that, Nick, if you wouldn't mind hitting the outro, we'll see you next time. Love you guys.